Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jay Darren Gross. This is the podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today, my guest is Trevor Mock. Trevor is the host of the Carrot Cast podcast and the CEO of Carrot, one of the nation's fastest growing companies, according to Inc. Magazine, where they have helped the nation's top real estate investors and agents pull in over 3 million online leads in just five years, closing thousands of deals with their software and training. Trevor lives in Roseburg, Oregon with his wife and three kids and is passionate about using business to fuel your passion and amplify your impact Uh, or the impact you want to make in the world. Part of the impact he's passionate about making is helping entrepreneurs unleash that entrepreneurial dream of finally unlocking that freedom, flexibility, finances, and impact that you've dreamed but have yet to be able to fully make happen. And in just a minute, we're going to speak with Trevor about online marketing and how to attract an audience and remain relevant. But first, a quick reminder, if you like our show, CREPN Radio, there are a couple of things you can do to help us out. You can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, we encourage you to leave a comment. We love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you want to see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. You can find us on YouTube at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And while you're there, please subscribe. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Trevor Welcome to CREPN Radio. Darren, man, I, I, I appreciate you having me on big time. And one thing I, I've got to mention, so we talked passion a little bit ago. Uh, I didn't realize you're a fly fisherman, a, steel fe- a steelhead fisherman. So um, uh, I see the video there, Deschutes River, fishing steelhead out there. Dude, we've got, we've got a shared, shared passion there, man. I love it. No, that's, that's a blast. That's uh, one of the, the great things the Northwest has is uh, yeah. the fishing. So, yeah. I figure if you're going to live here, you might as well figure it out. <laughs> That's right. I love it. I love it. But uh, hey, Trevor, I appreciate you doing this. I'm uh, looking forward to our, our talk today. But uh, before we get started, if you could take just a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Yeah, Darren. So kind of the, the short of it, you know, like you'd mentioned, I live in a small town here in Oregon called Roseburg. And um, it's it's not like the, the general metropolis of tech companies or real estate investors or anything like that, but that's kind of part of our purpose and part of our passion and mission. Like we were chatting right before we hit record, you know, we've got this building here. It's 8,000 square feet. It's a entrepreneur co-work space where a bunch of other amazing entrepreneurs, most of us online-based companies work out of here. Uh, and we're working on like one by one uh, acquiring buildings downtown Roseburg, Oregon to, to renovate, get amazing businesses in those buildings. Um, and we've just started it with the building next door as well. So that, that's kind of like the home where we live. But my company, Carrot, uh, we're a team of just shy of 50 employees right now. And that's a whole different story. And that's, uh, that comes from a guy who never wanted employees, always thought employees would be you know, a, a burden versus something that can unleash you. Uh, we help about almost almost 8,000 real estate investors today, mostly house flippers, wholesalers, a lot of commercial investors as well. Um, I personally use Carrot for generating leads for tenants um, for my rental properties and for my Airbnbs, but most of our clients generate motivated seller leads, uh, motivated house sellers primarily, uh, by the tune of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of motivated house sellers every year, uh, mainly from people going to Google, like people do a Google search, sell my house fast, insert in any city, and then you're probably going to find a number of Carrot sites towards the po- top of Google in every city in the country, uh, scooping up seller leads. So. That's kind of the high level of what we do, where, where we live. And uh, um, man, I'm, I'm excited to be on here with you. Oh, awesome. So, uh, you know, it's funny, um, you know, years ago and, and uh, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, there were certain cities that were recognized as kind of the, the hub mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, online or just, you know, more of your kind of centralized cities and stuff. And I think the pandemic truly proved that uh, you can be anywhere and uh, get work done and and a lot of people have made the decision to go anywhere yep um so i mean i, I would think that uh, in a weird way roseburg might have a, a special appeal uh, to people that are looking for the anywhere uh, that's got some sort of a, a hub 
have you seen any is it, has there been any inward migration um you know as of late I mean, that's, that's a really good question because I've, I've been high, I've been high in rural areas for, for years. And that's why, we, that's why we chose to stay in Roseburg and start this company. Right. Um, but even carrot, we're, we're a remote first company. So uh, while we have just shy of 50 full-time employees all, all in the States, we only have about eight to 10 here because some of those types of jobs are a little bit harder. Um, but we do have some employees moving from um, uh, uh, met, you know, metropolitan areas to Roseburg. Uh, Pete, my head of sales and customer success, he moved out here uh, with his his wife just recently from Baltimore, and they've been in Baltimore like their whole lives, and they they wanted the slower pace, you know. And I think that's what a lot of people are looking for right now is is oftentimes these urban areas um, that draw them to the urban areas uh, originally because of jobs and job opportunities. Uh, sometimes those very things, the busyness of it, the craziness of, of what has happened during the pandemic and all and all of 2020 in urban areas, I think people are looking out there going, you know what, I can work from anywhere I want to work now. And let me go do that. So this space here is an entrepreneur co workspace, but we don't have a lot of kind of open space. It's all dedicated offices, except for one space. And I really see Darren, if you're in a rural area, that is attractive for people to come to because of a slower pace where there are good amenities there. There's, you know, here there's 35 wineries in town. There's nine breweries. There's amazing outdoors things. Uh, you're not going to find the most vibrant nightlife. Everything shuts down at 10 o'clock, you know, but there's not a lot of that going on. But if you want an amazing place to raise a family, and that is the inflow we're seeing as people that moved out after high school, after college, they were away for seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years that got married and they're coming back here to start young families or with their young family for better quality of life now that they can work from anywhere. So we're doubling down on the concept of downtown in rural. We're doubling down on the concept of, of co-work spaces, especially in rural. Um, I think those are going to be amazing opportunities for commercial investors next 10 years. Oh, I love it. So your firm Carrot, uh, you mentioned some of the, the services or, or that you, you work with uh, real estate investors and, and um, uh, professionals. Um, can you describe a little bit about what Carrot is and how it works? Yep, for, for sure, Darren. So the, the original concept was this, was um, in kind of 2000 through 2010, you know, that's when the internet was kind of getting its feet. Uh, the, whole, the whole call to arms for all, all small business, you know, whether you're an insurance broker or you know, the local restaurant or a plumber or a real estate investor, uh, the whole call to arms was like, you got to get online. You know? So that's when you saw GoDaddy pop up and Wix and Weebly and Squarespace and all of those local mom and pop web developers in town, they all popped up during that decade, 2000 through 2010. And when, when I started entrepreneurship and business, it was right around 2008. And I, I saw the opportunity for using the internet to really grow a business, not just get online. Um, and, 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 and I started to learn how to make a website actually attract your best clients, you know, and what we have found Aaron was, was the most motivated people aren't the ones that got a direct mail piece that, that dropped on their, on their doorstep. Yet you're, you're going to activate demand for sure. The most motivated people are seeking out a solution actively. And in increasingly so since 2008, where, where are people doing it? The internet. And then when iPhones came up, you know, everyone pulls out their cell phone to do a Google search for anything that they want. And so that's the opportunity that we saw is we're like, man, everyone's online, but their websites aren't actually working for them. They're not actually attracting a lot of leads and then converting those leads at a high rate because websites were made to look pretty and, and to set up easily. They weren't made to perform back then. And so we stepped into that in 2014 and we're like, what if we were actually just to build websites that converted and actually ranked really, really well in Google? So when you sent a hundred qualified people to that, you would get out, you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 leads that you could actually work with instead of a few. And that's what we doubled down on is, is it was all about performance. How do we make your websites perform so you can stop losing leads and deals um, from an underperforming website? That's what got us to grow. Um, what kind of is getting us where we're, where we're going now is we really hyper-focus on what I call evergreen marketing, Darren. Um, there's outbound marketing, which works amazingly well. Your direct mail, cold calling, you're knocking on doors. All that works great for any business. Um, the problem with those types of marketing is it kind of keeps you on the hamster wheel. You know, in us, us as entrepreneurs, we want that freedom, like you'd mentioned earlier on. And, and you can't really have the freedom if you're always on this hamster wheel where you've got to make cold calls today to keep business coming and you've got to knock on doors. You've, you've got to send out that direct mail all the time. 
Um, the only way for you as an entrepreneur to get off the hamster wheel is for you to hire people to do it, which is a great option, or for you to choose marketing that actually works for years, not just weeks or days. And so we help people get off the hamster wheel and do what we call evergreen marketing through uh, Google. No, that's awesome. I mean, you're, you're, you know, spot on from, I mean, as a, a guy that was kind of a slow ski uh, to come to the, the market and, and understand just what, um, or I, I knew and I know that I need to be online, but mm -hmm. the whole, uh, just the, everything you described about just the, uh, the labor, the intensive labor of, of being online and creating a presence and, and, you know, continually updating and, you know, being some social media guy. Yep. I mean, it's, it's like a whole nother job, you know, <laughs> it is. I mean, it really takes your eye off the ball of what you do, you know, if you're constantly mm -hmm. trying to create content and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so l let's talk a little bit about w when you say evergreen content. I mean, my, yep. if you, when you say that to me, I'm, I'm, I'm envisioning something that's, that's timeless meaning that it's going to be relevant today and it's going to be relevant, you know, three years from today, presumably. Mm -hmm. um, and is that kind of what we're talking about there? Or? Dude, hundred percent. And so kind of the way that we approach evergreen marketing is this is, is number one, you know, we'll work with a ton of real estate agents and a lot of real estate investors, right? Uh, the majority of our clients are investors, but the real estate agents years ago, uh, they were taught and educated that social media is the thing, you know, so real estate agents are posting three, four, five times a day on social media, sometimes a lot more. And, and, and the, here's the thing, Darren, like every single time I talk about hamster marketing, like direct mail, cold calling, knocking on doors, um, you know, social media marketing, it's not that it doesn't work. It works amazingly well. What, what, what oftentimes we don't connect with is the fact that our marketing actually dictates our lifestyle. If we're doing marketing that requires us to stay on the hamster wheel and we can't get off or we'll, we'll see a downturn, then that, that business owns us. Like our marketing owns us instead of us owning the business. And so when, when I start to look about evergreen content, the first thing I, I look at is what are you already putting on social media? If you are active on social media, what types of videos are people putting on social media and how do we just repurpose that to get it over on a website in, in the right way that Google's going to like it. And I can kind of walk through a couple basic steps everyone can do. That's really simple. Um, but if you post a, a video or a picture or a post on, on Facebook or Instagram, it's amazing until 72 hours later when it's way down the list and almost no one sees it. And so you have to post again and always stay at the top of people's feeds and I can worry out, you know, what if you want to go on vacation? And you don't want to, you don't want to do that. And so what we'll, what we'll work with people on is say, okay, you know, who's your primary client? What's your primary prospect? And what are the situations that they would go through? Or what are the phrases that they would type in? Like for you uh, on the insurance side of things, you know, um, and I, are, are you, are, are, do you live in Oregon still, Darren? Yeah, I'm up here awesome. in Lake Oswego right now. Dude, so, that's yeah. my old stomping grounds. I lived up, I lived up right up. Um, um, oh my gosh, it's been so many years now. It was right by, uh, it's McVeigh, up McVeigh by the river, uh, the seven D's nursery, like right behind that is where, is where we lived for through for three uh, years. Yeah. We would have been neighbors almost. So oh, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. So in this example here, I'm just pulling up Google on my end, you know, let's say someone was looking for business insurance or there's a certain type of insurance in Portland. And I was going to type up, you know, insurance broker Lake Oswego. And so what I'm doing is I typed it up and Google has given me some suggested searches, right? And it popped up, you know, insurance broker like Oswego, health insurance broker popped up there. And then at the bottom of Google, and that's one thing I always do is what, what is the broad topic of what my prospects think I am and what are they looking for? And then I, I search it and then I scroll down to the bottom of Google and then it's going to give me a bunch of suggestions. And this one happens to be a bunch of company names. You know, it's like uh, Biznet Insurance Sisters Oregon, Biznet Insurance Hood River, uh, Full Heart Roger Biznet. So he must be a big insurance guy. I don't know. But uh, the cool thing is when you start to put out content and you do it consistently on your website instead of just social media, and that content is robust, it's not just 100 words, it's seven, 800, 900 words. Um, and that's what Google, Google was going to look at. You start to build up this authority hub on your website. So Google sees it as amazing, robust content. This guy, Darren, is an authority on insurance in Lake Oswego. And then your whole website's going to lift. And now you're going to be in front of that evergreen flow of your most motivated prospects who are closer to the buy decision uh, than someone else. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> I, I get the uh, kind of the, the local 
kind of thing is what is that what drives a lot of that presence uh or, or on the search yeah so the, the the local part it makes it easier to rank really well if you're localizing it so when we're working with an investor or an agent um their services are usually hyper local uh agents specifically are hyper local but we we do have a lot of investors who do business in three four five states or they buy they buy houses nationally and so what what happens is Let's say, you know, let, me, let me ask you a couple of questions here, Darren. Are there certain cities in, in your example, are there certain cities that you do business in that you're like, oh, these are my five favorite cities? Um, do you have cities like that or is it very There's general and broad? More of like the Northwest. I mean, I, I, I work with clients nationwide. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say that obviously just having a physical presence here and just, you know, local, there's there's a, 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 a significant uh, portion of my business that is Oregon and Washington, the, yep. you know, Port Portland metro area. So perfect. Yeah. And, and so that, that, that's the cool thing is it, it depends on how your, your primary prospects search. And so if they're going online to search local restaurants, of course, they're probably looking for a restaurant right there where they are, or possibly maybe they're looking for a place that they're going to be in the future on a vacation. Mm -hmm. But with insurance, they'll oftentimes type uh, their local area, right? This type of insurance in my local area. And what we what we pioneered shoot seven years ago in the real estate investor space is we would look at companies like LoopNet, and then Zillow, you know, came to follow, and we noticed, man, most of the people, mo most of the searches that I do on investment properties for sale, insert any city in the country, you're going to see LoopNet ranked number one, number two, or number three in Google, right? And we started to look at that and say, well, why is that the case? Uh, and then you'd click those links, and it's almost never their homepage. Like their homepage is never the thing that's ranked there. It's always a page hyper specific to that location for the thing I was looking for. And so we said, what, what if we can't take the same concept to the real estate investor space? And how do we, how do we amplify that? So uh, an investor would launch what we call a location page or a city specific page where you can launch a location page for that discipline. And if you're in business in 17 cities, you should have a page for every single one of those cities for, for the different types of services you offer. And so for you, if you offer three different types of insurance, it might be a great opportunity to put landlord insurance broker in, in Lake Oswego, landlord insurance broker in Beaverton, landlord insurance broker in Salem land. You, you get the idea, right? And create a, a separate page for each one of those. And so I, I know it sounds like work, but the, the thing I always like to say is, is hamster wheel is work forever. Evergreen is a lot of work in the first two years, the first year to first two years. And then uh, as it builds momentum and you stack, we call, we call it stacking bricks. As you stack those bricks, those, those sturdy pieces of content, they're going to, they're going to be up forever. The people are going to be searching those types of phrases for years. Uh, everything starts to build up for you. And you get momentum in about 18 months, two years after you do it. And then you look back and go, whoa, I'm getting leads uh, from all the work I did two years ago, from the work I did six years ago. Uh, for, for me, Darren, we, we built Carrot the exact same way. We didn't do any paid marketing for the first three years. And we said, what if we just went, went, went and looked at like, what are the phrases? And we're a national company. So we said, what if we just looked at the phrases that our ideal prospects are searching in Google and then we just started to create content around those phrases that was robust, you know, 800 words or more, was interesting, it was valuable. Uh, and then we just started to create one or two of those a week. And that was, our, that was our primary marketing strategy. And it could be phrases like how to invest in real estate, how to wholesale houses. Um, it could be motivated house seller leads. It could be websites for real estate investors, things like that. And so that might be a good strategy for you as well. Do the, we, we call it do the localized ones first for your primary business function, you know, uh, investment or uh, investment property insurance, landlord insurance, whatever it is in these locations. And then we go after the niche searches. What might they search that's more broad that isn't location-based? It could be what type of insurance should I get if I own a rental property, right? And that, that could be amazing content that you could create and build that authority hub on, on your website. I, I love the uh, you know, kind of the timeline and the two things I picked up from what you just said, there was the, uh, the timeline of expectation you know, anywhere from 18 months to two years. Hmm. And then also the, um, the um, just the volume of content, and the frequency, um, you know, something from uh, one to two articles uh, a week and uh, the, the length of the, the article. And, and then I think the, the key thing to all this, this is the, the key to all of it. If it's not interesting and valuable, it doesn't matter what you're doing. And there's yep. 
there's clearly a lot of people that, that tried to game the system. Unfortunately, Google got smart enough to recognize the game uh, in a lot of cases, but just, mm. um, you know, just if it is valuable and it's evergreen, I mean, that, that's, that, that works. And I, what, what's frustrating and also rewarding in this whole thing is uh, recognizing people that I know that have gotten, a, I don't want to say a head start, but they've done the work, like you said, they've put the bricks in place and now I see yeah. the leads coming in. I'm going, wow, okay, that really works. It's crazy. And, and yeah. here's here's the cool thing is the, the reason I even started to dive into this this type of marketing, Darren, was before before Carrot, um, I did a lot of hamster wheel marketing. And like I said, it worked. I made some good money. But this would have been 2011, 12. Um, in my previous company, it was an online business as well. But our, our income was kind of boom and bust, you know, where we would have $130,000 one uh, month, one month. And then we, then me and my business partner would split $6,000 the next month. Um, and then we lost money three months after that. And then we made another 70. And it's like, man, at the end of the year, your income statement looks pretty good, but you were stressed the entire year because you didn't know where your income was going to come from in three months. And, and when that happens, you can't really plan ahead. You, you can't plan ahead well and have confidence to hire an employee. because you're like, I don't know. It's all, it's so inconsistent. Um, you can't plan ahead well and say, you know what, I'm going to take a month off of work and I'm legit not going to work at all, or I'm going to not work as hard, or I don't have to do any marketing this month because I know it's coming in or whatever it is. Um, and I kind of had that, that dream. I'm like, man, what are the things in my business that I don't like? And in 2012, I sat down and wrote, wrote down a list and 2012 was this big transition year for me. I figured out how to get a business off, off, you know, off the, off the ground. And what I discovered, Darren, is about two to three years into a business, maybe three to four, uh, it's very common for, for us to uh, lose that edge, lose that excitement, lose that fire for that business that we had started. You know, because when we start this business, whether it's being a commercial real estate investor or, um, you know, any type of business, you're usually running away from something, right? You're running, running away from a job you didn't like. You're running away from an income ceiling you didn't like. You're running away from some people saying you couldn't do something and you want to prove them wrong. And then as soon as you make that thing work and you start to hit that, that income level that you were hoping for, or, or pr there's progression, that fire that you're running away from is gone. Now that motivation has gone and we forget to now run towards something. And so that happened to me in those early years as an entrepreneur. And I started to wake up during the, uh, you know, some days I'm like, why am I doing this? I'm not excited about what I'm doing right now. I feel like most of what I'm doing is just my energy being sucked out of me, but I'm making good money. So it, it was hard for me to, to justify it because the outside world was validating me saying, man, you've got what I want. And I had it. And I'm like, I'm miserable though. I just don't like it. And so during that time, I started to switch my mindset from trying to be productive and trying to like do productivity hacks to, well, shoot, how do I just have more energy during my work? How do I, can I base my work on energy instead of, instead of making a list of what makes me money and doesn't make me money and crossing out all the things and the stuff that doesn't make me money and saying, I'm not going to do that and doing more of the things that make me money. I said, well, what if I just flip the script and I just do a, an energy audit, I call it, and just make a list of all the things that drain my energy and all the things that give me energy, especially the things I'm not doing, that, but, but give me energy. And then I go, what if I just change my work towards energy instead of money? And maybe the income will follow if I do work that gives me more energy than not. Uh, and that's what led into evergreen marketing was I started to look at it and go, all the things that were draining my energy was me staying on this hamster wheel to try to get customers to come in. And I was executing all this stuff. And I looked at my p and in, in my leads and I said, well, there's this little line item of leads over here. And they were like our most profitable clients, but it was a, a minority of our income. And I said, man, I barely put any work into that. And that was work I did two years ago and it's still paying off. What if I just did all of that? It's going to take a while to transition. It's going to take a while to like transition me off of that drip of the instant gratification of, of, you know, paid marketing or things like that. But what if I just made that shift and what if my whole business was built off of that? And then I could do paid marketing or hamster wheel um, just if I wanted to, or if I wanted to grow and amplify it. And that's the shift I made. I'm like, no longer am I going to build a business that's inconsistent and unpredictable. I'm not going to build a business that isn't fun for me. I'm not going to build a business that, that is not based on my unique abilities. I'm, I'm going to really dive into it and embrace it. No, I love the, the energy uh, thought. I mean, cause that, it is just like, uh, you know, I got to do this again kind of thing. And, yep. and uh, you know, it's a grind and, and, and I've, I've worked with various uh, marketing people over the years and stuff. And, mm. 
and certain things, you know, produced, like you say, I mean, I've done, I've worked with uh, people making outbound calls and, mm -hmm. and uh, outbound marketing. I mean, and the reason why people do it is it works, It works. Uh, but if you don't do it, it's done. I mean, there's not yep. like a, a line of people still trying to get in. It's a matter of, of you got to pay to continue, you know, making the, the outbound calls in order to have the opportunities to, to make sales in that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, how did you, when you were sifting through that, make that decision of what was giving you energy versus mm -hmm. what wasn't? Because I think sometimes, you know, the, in a sales environment, especially, you know, like, ah, I'm making sales, you know, or, or, you know, making money because you're making sales. Yep. Um, that's energizing, but, you know, distinguishing between the activity mm -hmm. versus the, I mean, to, to realize really what was the root of that, you know, it sounds like you kind of went through, you know, the different sales you'd made and realized what customers uh, came from what efforts. Is that mm. kind of what, what you did or is that, I mean. Yeah, I, I, a little bit. I, I really took stock on everything, like everything in my life at that point. Cause, and, and I think a lot of people on this podcast can probably relate. You, you guys and gals might be in, in a spot in your, in your job right now or your business right now. We're like, man, I hate, I hate the goals that I thought I, would, I wanted to hit years ago. I've got the income coming in, but the clouds didn't part. The angels didn't sing. You know, it's like there's there's fulfillment is missing. And 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 um, it hit me. I had a friend or I have a friend uh, who I uh, was really successful, still is. And he was kind of like the guy at that time that I looked at and said, man, he's a man of faith. Like he, he's a father. He's coaching his kids football teams. He's got these two businesses. He's able to go to business number one on two days a week and just do what he wants to do. Business number two, he just does what he wants to do. And I'm like, I'm doing all this stuff, like all, all this stuff, even stuff I don't want to do. And it feels like, it seems like when I talk to him, he's more energized than not. And I said, Greg, what, what's your secret? And he said, man, he said, the biggest thing is you've got to figure out what your unique ability is. And he learned that from a guy named Dan Sullivan uh, with the company called Strategic Coach. And so Greg had talked to me about unique ability and I ended up actually joining strategic coach for a year in 2012, which, which changed the course for me. Cause that one little thing of unique ability unlocked for me. And, and this, this is where it was. And this is where the energy thing came from Darren was um, I was in workshop number three. I think you go quarterly to this, this strategic coach thing. I flew into Chicago every single quarter and they, they lay out a plan in front of you and they make you think about your business and your life. And the whole thing is to win back your time. So you can grow and grow a great business. And, the, the whole the whole unique ability thing wasn't clicking for me like I knew that I wanted to find it but I couldn't figure out what mine was because and on one hand you had a bunch of very smart people saying your unique ability or your um, you know whatever you want to call it your superpower or whatever is things that people will tell you you're really good at and you get paid really well to do right people say you're really good at it and you get paid really well to do they're like do more of that and that's what I did for those three years that's what got me a pretty good business and made some good money and it's also what got me so I completely wore myself out and lost my fire because half the things that were making me really good money and people said I was good at completely drained my energy and I did not want to do them. And I'll give you some examples. Um, I love strategy, right? Love strategy, but I hate actually the execution of the thing. So like, I want to come in and blow up the whiteboard and I'm going to sit here and then I just want it to be done. You know, the, the things to be done. But if I have to sit and write the emails or do this, like, ah, oh, it just sucks the life out of me. Um, I, I love, love, love doing these things. This gives me energy. Um, but what I don't like is writing content, which is kind of funny because that's what my business is built off of with Carrot. Like even, even when I started Carrot, I'm like, I'm content forward. And, um, and I found myself wearing myself down writing late at night to get to a deadline to get an article out and going, man, I love the evergreen marketing thing, but I don't like, I don't get energy from the writing. I get energy from the strategy of coming up with the articles and the topics, but I don't want to sit down and write. And so for me, the energy audit actually became a process that I do quarterly and you guys can find it. I mean, it's a free worksheet. I don't even think you have to download. I don't think you have to opt in for it. Just go to carrot.com forward slash energy, carrot.com forward slash energy, no opt in, nothing. I just want people to use it and, 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 and get it. But I took a piece of paper, drew a line down the middle and on the left side, I'm like, okay, uh, the definition of, of your unique ability from strategic coach is you'll know that you found it when uh, you, when you get more energy, when you're done doing the thing, than when you started, you have more energy when you're done doing the activity than when you started. Um, and it's something you could be amazing at potentially world-class at if you worked at it hard enough. And so I said, okay, let me find what those things are. And so I drew a line down the middle of the paper on the left side, it was dr energy drain and the right side it was energy give. 
I said, let me just write a list of all the things on an average week that I do currently that drain my energy. It's like writing emails and doing this and writing blog posts and having these types of meetings and put, put stuff in your life too, right? Like this type of chore at home. I don't want to mow my lawn. I don't like that. And so all, all these things on there. And on the right side, it's what gives you energy, especially the things you're not doing right now. Okay. I liked working out. I wasn't working out. It gives me energy. I wasn't doing it though because I didn't think I had time. Okay. I love strategy, but I don't like execution of the strategy. I love having conversations like this with smart entrepreneurs. I love uh, dreaming and vision. I don't like actually executing the vision. Right. And there's, and I'm looking at it going, ah, all the th a lot of things that make me money are on the left side. And the things on the right, I'm like, I don't know how to have, make money just having conversations with smart people. I don't know how to make money just strategy, not executing it. Like, how the heck does that happen? And so one by one, Darren, I did this. I said, okay, I don't have to know how to do it. But what if I could just start switching energy draining activities for energy giving activities every quarter? And let me do, let me kind of take a synopsis at the bottom of that sheet. And let me write down what percentage of my average week right now is these things that drain my energy versus these things that gives me energy. And at that time, Darren, 2012, it was about 70% energy draining, 30% energy giving. No wonder I wasn't liking my work anymore. No wonder, right? right. I'm like, oh, damn, the answer's right there. It's energy. It's not productivity. It's not, so if I can get more of these crappy things done, it's, I just need to stop doing those things. And so every quarter I do that list. I still do it today. Circle one or two of the items that drain my energy the most. Write down how many hours per week I do on those things. Let's say seven, seven hours on writing blog posts per week and three hours on this other thing, checking email or whatever it is. And I go, cool. Over on the right side, what thing gives me energy that I'm not doing enough or not at all that I want to replace with that seven plus three to 10 hours a week I'm buying back and I'm going to replace it with this other thing over here, even if it doesn't make me money. Um, because on the article side of it, let's say it was seven hours a week. I'm like, I'm just not going to do it anymore. I love the strategy side. I'm going to, I'm going to lead the strategy of my articles. I need to find someone who's amazing to write them now. And so that continues that money-making activity continues. I replaced it with starting my podcast because it gives me energy. I'm like, I have no clue how to make money from it. I just want to do it because it gives me energy. That's it. No, I, I just love the, the whole energy essence of it as, as opposed to the focus on like the money mm -hmm. uh, side thing or, or something because energy is something you can feel. And, and, you know, like oh, I remember years ago, um, um, I remember I, I bought a ski boat and it was just like, there was this passion that was just like, yep. it was, you know, every, every day I was like trying to get my work done as fast as I could. Cause I knew as soon yep. as I had done, I could say, Hey guys, I'm at the lake. Let's go. Cool. You know, and, and there was just, but it was, and it was, it, it was like kind of the lead of, of, you know, whenever I was talking to people, you know, I was like inviting them on the boat or, or there was just like, there was some energy, you know, like mm -hmm. you said, energy. Yep. And uh, just, but just to have that, that energy and, and, and it's, and it was such a giving thing, even though there was a cost to it, the, the give was way more beyond the, the cost in that. It's going to make every, every other part of your life better. Right. And, and that, that yeah. was kind of the bet that yeah. I was making in 2012 there. And I said, I don't know if it's going to work, but what, you know, what, what if all of these things over here, working out, doing, starting a podcast, only doing strategy or mainly doing strategy it doesn't mean I'm only doing that. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't have a team at that time. So I'm, I'm looking at this going to shoot. So how am I going to do this stuff if I don't have a team? Well, I, I once again, I, every quarter, that was, that was the first stuff on my plan that quarter. It was, it was create a process for this thing and then find a person to do that thing because I'm not going to do it anymore. Create a press for this thing. We're just saying no to it. So I hired an assistant. She took over my email and she took over a lot of those things. And her and I still do the energy audit quarterly. Trevor, what, what, what did you get back on that energy drain list that, that is there now that wasn't before? Oh, what's this? How much time a week is it taken? Man, about this. I don't even know how I let it slip back in there, but it did. And, and then it's like, all right, well, how, how many hours there? What two things? Okay, what do you want to add back in? I need to get working out again. Okay, cool. Then she would help me on that. And just one by one, Darren, it didn't happen overnight. I started to make that shift. And that's when I really embraced building a team because I never wanted to build a team before. It was, all, it was all about how do I keep the most money in my pocket because every employee is, is reducing what's um, in my pocket and it's a burden. Uh, today, almost 50 employees. Is it a challenge? Yeah, it's a challenge, but I wouldn't trade it for the world because I've got my time back. I've got my freedom and we're making more impact than we ever could have made before. But I, I love the, the periodic review kind of thing where you've mm -hmm. got, you know, you're doing it because I think that, you know, it's too easy to get into the, the routine of the day of the week of the month of the year. And the next thing you know, there's years gone by yep. and you're still at the same point. 
and uh, to have that kind of periodic review and just be very conscious about what you're doing mm -hmm. and where you want to go, yeah. um, which is, is awesome. I appreciate you sharing all that. Yeah. And one, one final thought on that, Darren, just kind of piggybacking of, of what you just said there is for the people listening to this, you, you might be looking at this going, well, you know, Trevor, of course you can have energy in the software company named after a vegetable. And like we, we have everything in this office is orange. We have carrot dolls. We send out thousands of them every year. Like we do things intentionally that are fun guys. It has nothing to do with the type of business I have. Cause I know plenty of software company owners who have completely boring businesses and their energy is getting drained in it. It was just a conscious decision to say, what is it about business that I want to amplify that gives me energy that I have fun doing? It doesn't make any business sense that we make a line of dolls that are carrot, like super carrot and farmer carrot and all that. It's just fun to do. And, and, and we like it and it gives us energy and it happens to be a good business decision too, because people like it and they post them on social media. So if you're in real estate, if you're a commercial real estate investor, if you're an insurance uh, broker, awesome. The energy audit is actually going to be a way to help you enjoy your business better. Because we oftentimes despise our businesses, not because of the type of business that it is, but because of what it's taking from us, because it's taking our energy from us, because it's not letting us live uh, those passions. And so uh, one thing I, I learned years ago, I thought I had to build a business around my passion. You like boating, you like fishing. I love mountain biking. I love fishing. I thought, man, I'm going to have to like start a business in that. And what I what I'd realized is, no, we have to have, we have to start a very intentional business that gives us energy that gives us what we want. The business supports us other than rather than us supporting it. And it takes work to get there. It's not overnight. But then how do we make the business fuel our passion? It doesn't have to be it. You know, if you love boating and, and love fishing, it's like awesome. How do you bake that into your business? You know, is there a, a, a more active way that you can even have annual or monthly or quarterly boating and fishing trips with your clients? And you just do it because it's fun and you celebrate it and you post on social media. You know, is there a way that that you can uh, bake in some some other uh, way of purpose or passion into that? And I think this podcast is probably part of it for you, too. Yeah, no, I, I think that you, you're spot on it is, is, you know, it's part of your life. It's not like this extra thing. It's it's all yep. baked into together there. And mm -hmm. and, uh, and definitely when you have a passion and, and you're able to live it and share it with others, it just shows and it, and it attracts it attracts people to come. Uh, and work with you. So mm, I appreciate time. you sharing that. Hey, Trevor, if we could, uh, I'd like to shift gears here for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned to you earlier that uh, by day I'm an insurance broker. Yep. And uh, there's a couple of things we do with with clients when we're assessing risk and trying to, term, to determine what to do with it. And there's uh, three different strategies we typically look to. Uh, we first look to see if there's a way we can avoid the risk. If that's not an option, we look to see if there's a way we can minimize the risk. And when we can't avoid nor minimize the risk, and we look to see if we can transfer the risk. Mm -hmm. And that's what an insurance policy is. And I like to ask my guests if they can look at their own situation. It could be their clients, investors, uh, market, tenants, however you want to define it or identify. But uh, if you can take a look at your situation and, and you know, tell us what you consider to be the biggest risk. Mm -hmm. And for clarification, uh, I just want to make sure you understand I'm, I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance related answer. Yep. So if you're willing, I'd like to ask you, Trevor Mock, what is the biggest risk? Yeah, this, this, this is a good question. So four years ago, we started when, when we do our annual planning. One of the first things that we do, you know, like we'll set numbers and goals and stuff like that. But then right after that, we, we do an exercise where it's like, um, it's kind of, kind of a SWAT, I guess you could call it, but it's like, what could kill us? What, what could kill this business? Um, because oftentimes we ignore those things that truly could take us out and they take us by surprise. And so the, the things at the top of that for us are if, since we're so heavily focused on Google, um, and not all the leads for our clients come through Google searches, it could be from paid ads and things like that, but we're very heavily focused on Google. If there was a major change in Google and we got our caught with our, our pants down and our websites all of a sudden for some reason weren't exactly what Google was looking for, uh, that would be decently catastrophic. And so um, we take that and go, okay, how do we make sure that that's front and center in our product whenever we're looking at anything product related? How do we make sure we're always relevant in Google? We're staying ahead of the curve. We're, you know, websites are fast, things like that. The second one, Darren, I'll just give you two here, is... Um, be, being frank right now in this business, um, 
I've been building a leadership team. We had, we had an outside company come in and did a really good audit uh, for our three-year vision moving forward. So we all kind of knew what were the weaknesses and what were our blind spots. And I, and I had kind of known it, but um, what, what it came up is that I am too key on the strategy side in way too many parts of the business where people from all around the company see me as, ne as necessary on the strategy and I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally didn't lead well there in those certain spots. Because if I'm that key, if something happens to me, they all feel this thing's going to fall apart. And so we got around a table and it's like, how do we make this not true? You know, what, what's in my brain? Where do we need to upgrade leaders? Um, you know, key man insurance, that is an actual thing that we did um, about a year ago when we did that. And uh, it's, it's given me peace of mind for me and my co-founder for sure. No, again, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and uh, you know, not only are you talking the talk, but you're walking the walk and kind of figuring it out and, and trying to uh, make it all, uh, you know, work for a long time. I appreciate that. Mm, for sure. Um, Trevor, uh, where can the listeners go if they would like to learn more or connect with you? Man, there, there's a couple spots. So I'm, I'm really active on Instagram. I don't post a lot over there, but I answer every, every single DM. I'll post maybe a couple times a week. Um, kind of document behind the scenes at, at, at my business here. I'm also a real estate investor, y'all. So uh, I own, you know, commercial real estate. I own some, um, uh, some multifamily and some uh, Airbnbs as well. It's kind of my side hobby. But um, carrot.com is a primary. If you want to kind of learn about what we're doing, we put a ton of content up there for free. So if anyone in your team just wants to learn how to get leads for sellers, buyers, tenants, things like that, go to carrot.com. Lots, lots of free info. Um, and then I've got the podcast called the carrot cast. Uh, just look it up carrot cast and Apple podcasts or Spotify or, or go to carrotcast.com. And, um, about half the episodes are interviews with investors that are out there crushing it. Some, some big multifamily commercial investors as well. Uh, and then half of them are literally me in my truck with my cell phone. When I'm driving home, it takes 15 minutes to get there. I call them Trevor truck talks. And it's just what's on my mind as an entrepreneur, not related to real estate at all. And uh, I love doing them. Yeah. So carrot cast. Awesome. Well, Trevor, I can't say thanks enough for taking the time to talk today. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, learned a lot, and uh, hope we can do it again soon. Darren, I'm, I, I absolutely love the opportunity, love what you're doing. And hopefully, since we're not too far away, man, we can meet up for lunch or something someday. Let's do it. I, I, I welcome it and look forward to it. Awesome. So Thank you, Darren. Make it happen. All right. And for our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.